You made it. Here. Finally. Checked out of office to check into the sweet views of that place you've always wanted to go. You know the one. It's nice. Even the kids like it. This place is so cool. And they never like it. Mom, can we go to the pool? Look at that. Not even asking for the Wi-Fi. When you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Today on the show, comedian Avi Lieberman tells an amazing story about getting in and out of Russia. I had been traveling during COVID. So I used Israel as kind of my base. I had COVID very early, so I had the antibody. So I wasn't really scared about traveling. I was like, well, I'm going to bail. I'm going to get out of here and just go to whatever's open and try to have some sense of life. Because no one was really traveling. So these hotels were super cheap. And so I was like, I'll just take advantage. Might as well. When am I going to be able to stay in the premier palace in the Ukraine in Kiev again? That's not going to happen. Today on the show, comedian Avi Lieberman shares an amazing story about getting in and out of Russia during COVID. Stay close. Hey, it's Avi Lieberman, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed the show last week with comedy writer Michael Jammin. And Michael was somebody I did not know, but somebody else hooked me up with him. And Michael, turns out, he was like the executive producer, showrunner, all that good stuff on a lot of television series like Just Shoot Me, King of the Hill, and more recently, Marin. And he does some really uh, popular YouTube uh, YouTube comedy skits. Anyway, skits. Yeah, that's what they're called. They're called skits, Avi, you know. Of course. Are you doing your comedy <laughs> skit? That's always uh, your... I, I love hearing that before I go on stage. <laughs> yeah, you just go, go up and you do your little skit, your little yeah. part. And then um, anyway, it, it's a very funny episode because, well, it's funny because he, this is when he just started off in L.A. He's like a writer's assistant. And the showrunner asks him, can he cat sit? And so, of course, he says yes. And it's a beautiful English tutor here in Los Feliz. And, but it's a dark house and it's a weird house. And it's at one point he sees basically, basically he sees an aberration. Just go right up the stairway. Like not something that you see in a glance, but something that he followed. <laughs> he could follow, you know what I mean, with his eyes. And the point is, is that the uh, when he got back to work, the showrunner said, you know, you know, when she said, how did it go? She could tell before he even said anything, you know, that it happened. And she says, oh, you saw the ghost. Oh, that's nice to throw someone in a haunted mansion. That's always uh, <laughs> most thrilling. <laughs> I know. I would have been like, what the hell is wrong with you, man? He's like, I couldn't because she was the boss. Anyway, great story. Go back, you guys. Listen to Michael Jammin last week, but not today. Stay with me today because today I'm with a friend and another comedian who's all the way across the country in Miami, Florida. And that guy is Avi Lieberman. And I got to tell you, Avi, I've been wanting you on the show I'm going to go nine years. Oh, thank you. You should let me know earlier. I promise I would have come on a lot earlier. earlier. Yeah, I know, but we weren't, you're away a lot. That's you're true. Out yes, of, I am out of the a country lot. a lot. Yeah. And so before the, the pandemic, my first 600 shows, my That's first That's amazing you've done that many, by the way. Thank you. My first 600 episodes were, of course, in person. And then the pandemic hit. Because, like, at that time, it was, like, my thing, you know, like, oh, no, I got to be with the person, you know, so I'm getting the right vibe. And yeah. it's like. All our shows used to be in person. Do you remember those days when we, when that was allowed? So, I know. So. That's what I mean. So it's just like, I, I'm just saying, obviously, we all had to change our ways. Right. And Adjust. so now it's more practical to have you. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad I'm here. And today you bring forth the topic, getting in and out of Russia. Yes. And I've never been to Russia, but I have dated Russian comedian Yakov Smirnov. Did you seriously date him? 
I did. My audience actually knows this because now and then I put it into the conversation because it is hilarious, right? Yeah. It is hilarious. It is hilarious. And, and you know, I'll tell you, like I do a lot of open mics here in L.A. because I don't have nearly the comedy career you have. You have a un- – Avi, you have an unbelievable comedy. Well, as they say, you know, get good at it and find your niche. So with me, it's like, hey, we need someone to do 45 minutes to an hour of squeaky clean material in front of a bunch of Orthodox Jews. Good luck. Like most comics can't or have no interest in doing that. I'm good at that. I obviously still do the other stuff, too. But, you know, I was just in uh, Reno a a few weeks ago with Mark Schiff and then Vegas uh, before that. But, yeah, it's we all have our niches. That's one of mine. So I end up doing a lot of those kinds of shows. I'm a, I'm a go-to Jew for those events. So, <laughs> so that's what I'm doing here. It's Hanukkah. So I have 39 shows over the holiday. And then, uh, <laughs> wow. but then I'm in Aruba with, you know, Ray Allen and Judy Gold. And so, you know, that should be fun. That's mm-hmm. so great. I love Judy Gold. Yeah, she's, she's been great. on the show she's here. A riot, yeah. An amazing lady. Yeah. Um, but, but, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I got to Los Angeles in 1997, and I remember you from way back then. Right. And you just have come so far. I have gone way off path. No, what are you talking about? You have a successful podcast. I can't do that. I don't have the patience to do the podcast thing. So. Well, that's yeah. true. That's true. No, I've done a lot of great things that I'm excited about. But I'm just saying, your comedy career, like you have 39 dates over the holidays, it's just, it's really impressive, and it's exciting because... Oh, thanks, um, yeah. I found that it's more like a lot of effort. I, you know, I obviously take years to learn that and when you're putting more when you focus on this is what i want to do and that's that like i remember first the focus is i just want to get on stage that's when you first start and then stage time and then it's will i want to be able to get paid at some point and i think it's a gradual progression of like you know doing it for a living and then you want to get on tv sort of and then when that became my focus like i was able to achieve it and then I think every comic sort of branches out. You have to obviously cast a wide net in entertainment. Some comics become really successful writers or actors or whatever. You're kind of pushing, you know, stand-up is, I think, just one of the things, you know, that you do. Most comics, even the massively successful ones, yeah, they act too. You know, there's always, it's, it's, a, it's a broad range that you can do. Yeah, I always so, say that. Everybody is slash this, slash that. Yeah, that's, I was like, I laugh. It's, yeah, when I, when I hear comics like angry will... I can't believe this person made it huge. I'm funnier than this person or this person. I go, yeah, well, maybe they work harder than you. That, you know, yeah, that's what, what you have that? to take into account. You know, maybe they're, they're workhorses or they, well, they it's true. And like for you personally, I'm, I don't know you that well, but you never got married and you don't have children. Is that right? True? I'm working on that. I was just funny. I was just talking to my, <laughs> my psychologist about that, which I was funny. Interesting. I was seeing the psychologist about a huge car accident. I was in a few months ago, but did see, I was like, well, let's focus on this. I'm like, yeah, but I'm ready to get married. I've, I've had it with dating and it's, uh, Aww. well, you know. well I, okay. So what are your go-to, uh, what are your go-to dating sites? What, what's it going to be, Avi? I've had some decent luck uh, with Hinge. The, the, so that one's been all right for me. It used to be in the old days, you know, it was J-Date. Here's the, here's the thing with the, with, with the Jews, you know, because I'm a big Jew, so you want to, like, marry one. And um, it used to be J-Date, and then it mer- morphed to uh, J-Swipe. Oh, and wow. And then everyone was like, no, no one does that anymore. So now it's just like Hinge, I think, is pretty good because you can kind of filter what you're looking for. So that's kind of helped. I thought there was also one called... Um, c- c- Sit down and drink coffee or coffee. It's just coffee and a bagel. Oh, yeah, you know, my friend met his wife on that one. Uh, ba- uh, bagel on and coffee. coffee. Yeah, I think they met and they are married with two kids and, you know, very successful marriage and everything. So it's, I just think it just depends. As I, I don't poo-poo any of them. I think yeah. some of them are great for some people. And, well, you know, the thing is, own. whoever whoever you get together with, you know, they have to be very flexible with your crazy schedule. Yes. Now, I used to use that as an excuse. I'm just like, well, that's, I'm gone a lot. So that's my excuse for not settling down. But then, and then I have my other friends of mine. My friend has four kids and he travels more than me. He's like, look, it just has to be kind of the right fit, you know. And, and it's, I talked to flight attendants once. I was like, is that hard your way? They're like, no, it never gets stale. Like we, yeah. we like, you know, giving each other space and you just have to have the, you got to marry somebody who has the right personality to deal with whatever crap you're going to, you know, throw their way and vice versa, yeah. obviously. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, but you know, like uh, I mentioned briefly, I've dated a comic who works, who at that time worked a lot. And th- what it was for me is you, I feel like that kind of guy needs somebody who is out of the business, not in the business. Oh yeah. I think it's, 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 competitive that you know if somebody has a bigger career than the other one there's always these feelings of that you know angst and upset how come you're getting this and they're going to be ups and downs so i would prefer obviously to date a girl who has 
no showbiz aspirations whatsoever because they, right. they don't really care about this kind of right. stuff. And, no, I you know. get it. So what are you thinking? Like, are you thinking like a medical person, a scientist? Um, I don't particularly care. It's obviously it's sort of the stereotype in, you know, the Jew world is, yeah, oh, she's a teacher or, mm-hmm. you know, a big thing. The more religious you go, there is a lot of, you know, physical therapists, occupational therapy. And that's, it, you know, because you can take that anywhere. You know, that's what they'll teach a lot of the girls. You can marry somebody and move anywhere and get a job. Um, but th- yeah, as long as she's happy doing what she's doing, and I think they I teach that to everybody because it's truth. You know what I well, mean? Like nurses. Nowadays, the world and- is so different. You know, when you can just take a, take a laptop and do it from wherever. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, so it's, you just have to see. Like I talked no. to my friend Mark Schiff, who's uh, married. So and his his wife Nancy. So sometimes she'll come on on gigs with him if they're fun ones. And if she's not in the mood, she won't, you know, so that's kind yeah. of the ideal situation. That, that is, yeah, that is super fun for sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I know it's interesting because it is, a, but like I was a flight attendant for over seven years. So okay. I know. So you've seen the world, you know. Oh, right? yeah. I know that life. But like my husband at the time got another girl pregnant. That's you know always I mean? fun. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, like I always tell people I'm flexible, but. I'm not now, that That's flexible. a new level of flexibility. So that you have and to deal so with. <laughs> my point is, is that if you start getting involved with people that travel, there's a lot more trust stuff that you have to consider. Right. No, of course. Of course. All right. I just yeah, wanted to cover that. It me so much. I would hope that I'd have to be married to a woman who'd just be like, get out of my face. I need my space. You well, know, so. make sure you marry somebody closer to your age then because the yeah, maturity yeah, no, level. I, it's very difficult for me to talk to girls in their 20s anymore. Sorry, girls, if you're out there. But it's in terms of dating. It's You know, right. you've talked to guys in their 20s. I think of how horrendous yeah. I was back then. So, like you know, it's, it's, just, it, it's all good. Yeah, it's just that the thing is, is they're going to, they haven't even gone through one marriage yet. Those guys, you know what I mean? Like you yeah, need to get somebody no, no, who has some experience. You don't want to be with somebody who wants a big way. Yeah, it's that experience. Want. Yeah. So it's, it's about, yeah. And you're a smart guy. So I, I hope so. Well, but if you know, I can you, fool you, Christine, that's an, well, here's <laughs> the thing. You don't know, man, you see yeah. it happen all the time. You know, these big stars choosing, you know, really young and immature people and then they're just blown away by yeah. why they want so many children why did it work out because she couldn't vote that's why it couldn't work it didn't work out so you have to you know alec baldwin happens to be married to a woman and i think she's like 20 years younger 25 years younger then she goes and has six children they have six children. Yeah, you know, I think there's a maturity. I think it's, if I've seen plenty of girls, young or women, I should say, and then they're mid and early twenties. And I think once you have a child, it's, it's a new level of maturity. So it's, I, I find those women way more mature. Than, well, yeah, because they've lived know, a life. Yeah, but I'm just so saying, like thing, Alec Baldwin is what ninety eight. Something like I mean, that. But he plays 88. <laughs> it's Hollywood. That's the important thing. So, yeah. Anyway, it's uh, what an interesting couple there. Okay. You mentioned briefly your car accident. Now, I do want to touch upon that because your sure. topic today, like we talked about, is getting in and out of Russia. But let me ask you about that car accident you had because I'll tell you, man, that the news of that car accident like rippled through Twitter, Facebook, and everywhere else. Like a lot of people were concerned. Yeah, no, it was very nice. I had no idea. Yeah, I was basically I was in Miami. It's weird being back in the scene of the crime. I was talking about that with uh, the shrink today online. And um, yeah, I was here with a. I was staying at a friend's place, same place I'm staying now. And um, he was in Puerto Rico. He does like real estate stuff. And he said, "Oh, I'm coming back to Miami for the weekend." He was in New York for a wedding. That and I, he was one of the nicest guys in the world. He said, "You use my car when I'm here." And um, I just had some shows here. I, I had like one big show that was booked here for a synagogue, like a, like a big fundraiser. It was the first like decent big job I'd had in a long time, you know, after COVID was, was winding down. And I said, oh, I'll come pick you up, obviously, you know, and I pick him up and it's his car. I say, hey, do you want to drive? He goes, yeah, sure. And we drive and we got in this huge accident. I, we were basically T-boned. My side got hit by a truck, a Dodge Ram. <laughs> I joke on stage, I go, uh, they took the Ram part seriously, not the Dodge part so much. And then, uh, <laughs> Um, so I had a fractured skull, a hematoma, a bleeding artery in my brain. And this, I was 25 minutes away from being dead. And, uh, it's thank God, you know, Dr. Lozen, who did the brain surgery, like, you know, saved me literally. And then, uh, you know, Dr. Bowie and these other physicians and I was at Aventura general, the nurses were great. And I was very fortunate that I wasn't hurt more seriously, but I was able to get out of the hospital in nine days. And how you know, far I really had from you, thing. how far away were you from the hospital and how fast did it take the ambulance to get to you? Yeah, it's interesting that I don't know. I don't remember getting hit, but I remember coming to, 
that, and feeling like the blood coming out of my ear. And I was kind of disoriented because everything was smashed around me and like airbag in front of me. And I felt like I could, I felt kind of trapped and I just kind of conked out again. And then I had the sensation of being yanked out of the driver's side by the EMTs. Put, and then I woke up again and then put on a gurney and the feeling of my head being kind of stabilized. I couldn't move it. And then in and out, of, the feeling of going up and down. I'm in the ambulance. And then I remember kind of being in and out and somebody leaning over me and going, you're in an ambulance. And he kind of had a smirk on his face. Apparently, I was babbling incoherently. And I looked down and I saw, saw the blood on my shirt and scissors kind of going down the shirt on my chest, cutting it off. And then I was out. And then so I don't know in terms of the time of the ambulance between getting because I was, I was kind of in and out of consciousness. And the next thing I know, I wake up and I see my parents kind of walking in the room and my friend Rachel on the phone talking to somebody. Um, but uh, so I'm not sure about that. But I know they told me afterwards I was it, it was close. Like it was about another 20, 25 minutes that would have been, you know, gone. And time. so but then, how you know, was your friend? He was all right. Thank God that it hit my side. He had some like internal. He had like some bruising on the bottom right side of his like, you know, uh, sort of like rib stomach area. But um, soft tissue damage, but thank God he was okay. He didn't require hospitalization or anything. Um, so he was okay. Um, and then, yeah, it was just one of those weird... My brother came in. I, you mentioned people mentioning it. My brother comes in after a few days. Uh, you know, he showed up like a day later. And he goes, you know how many people are checking on you? I go, no. I like, I don't. He goes, a lot. So that was kind of nice to hear. Was that the comedic community, was especially, especially was very supportive. So, that, you know, it was very nice to know that people gave a crap, you know. So. Well, do you remember thinking about or seeing your, um, you know, your friend in, in the vehicle with you after the crash? Or well, was I he just, just I not even coming to for a split second and kind of looking outside. And he was, I see him on a phone walking back and forth. He was clearly trying to. That, you know, get get this handled. I, he said, the smartest thing he said, I grabbed your phone immediately. This, my phone's like, and I just got a new one. I just got the new iPhone 12. This, you know, and he, he said that was key for him in terms of trying to track down people and, like, you know, make sure people knew about it. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting, oh. and when I talk to people now about a game of, like, how they found out, and my friend, friend knew that they knew this person knew my brother, so they got, and then this person who called my brother, and then that, that was it. That's what got the ball rolling. Yeah, the so, social, and then the social media hit. And so who was the person driving the truck? That, I, I don't know. To this day, I don't know. There's, apparently that person was okay, but claiming injuries. But then here was the beauty is my friend Laura was in town who was a friend of mine. She lives in Tel Aviv. She does a lot of charity work for uh, an Israeli ambulance service. That, and she calls me, and she kind of operates in a higher echelon of society, shall we say, which is good. And she goes, here's your lawyer. He'll handle it. Put the stress of that out of your head. Have a nice day. Talk to you soon. So that's, and that was it. The guy called me, couldn't have been nicer. And everyone's like, this is your guy. He's great. And, uh, not well, an ambulance great. chaser is a big firm. And he's like, that's don't so take good. it easy. I've got it. Just relax. And, wow. and so he's been very helpful. He and everybody in that firm have been, have been helping me out. So yeah. to navigate this on your own, you're getting all these bills from hospitals. I don't know what to do that, you know, and the first is interesting. Even my, they denied coverage in Florida. I go, why? He's like, well, there's this thing called PIP in insurance you have to have personal injury protection because you're not a florida resident so you don't need to, i didn't know this stuff you know he knows this stuff yeah. he's a lawyer so right. he said i'll handle it don't worry about it so it's just like small things like that you obviously can't do this yourself it's it's too hard i remember so, seeing a picture of you with your head shaved on one side because you know you had yeah, to have 32 staples in my skull yeah so, so was it brain surgery or what yeah, was emergency it? brain surgery they had to um it's, he sort of moved the bone out of my skull and like did, took care of the, the blood, the pressure, the hematoma that was there. He cleared that out, fused the artery in my brain that was bleeding, slid that bone kind of back in. He said that'll fuse on its own in about a year and you'll be fine. And that was it. So I got very fortunate though that, you know, I had no vision issues. I had no balance issues. And, you know, I got very, very lucky. The word miracle was used a lot um, while I was wow. in there. So. Wow. You know, That's physical therapist a, came in. She's like, I've been doing this 20 years. I've never seen this. Somebody who went through what you went through with no long-term issues with that. I still have a fractured bone in my left ear, uh, which they said that they, they can't really do surgery. They said there's no need to do surgery. It's like a 10, you know, said if you're, if, if you're have a lot of background noise and someone's talking to you, you might have a little bit more trouble than someone who has no issues at all. But he said, that's as bad as it'll get. Uh, the good part growing up in Houston, you know, have the medical center there. So I went and rehabbed at my parents' place. And we oh, could see all nice. the doctors at the medical centers. That was kind of nice. So you, you could know, see the experts there. So I was also thinking that people knew because you didn't make that gig, right? So now they know and they have to cancel yeah, your I gave, gig. Yeah, you gave it to Stephen Scott. Lucky hit, you know. So, so, 
Good I for him. See, he's all right. He, he's a great. He'll do a great job. So uh, he was very thankful. So they needed oh. somebody, right? So <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's nice. So oh, that's good. That that does happen in the comedy yeah. world yeah. where somebody fills in. And I've even told friends that want to be on Story Smash, but they've already been on the game show. And I'll say, listen, I will you be one of my backups? And they'll be like, yeah, yeah. And then sometimes I do have to call them last minute. Yeah, and of course. The, the, yeah, it's, I was in, I remember I was in Vegas where I, I had like a different event there or something, and I dropped by the Improv. Uh, at Harris, that's where I worked for years, just to kind of say hi to the gang. And um, this, I dropped in to say car- hi to Carl, who's like the light and sound guy, uh, and kind of the manager there. That, and um, I come in, and Kenny Bob Davis was working that week. God rest his soul, he's a great guy. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. And he, um, that he wasn't feeling well that night. And he calls it, and Carl goes, well, Avi's here. He's like, just have Avi do it. So, and I just filled in for him, that, and he paid me. He wanted to give me money. I, I was like, I'm not taking money. And he insisted, like, you have good. to do this. You're getting, you know, I was just like, and Carl was like, just take it. He's going to be, he's not going to let yeah, you off. Yeah, that's good. He's such a nice guy. He's like, all right, you know. But um, that happens, you know, you'll fill in for somebody who needs help. Uh, you know, yeah, and you have to take the money. I mean, that's your expertise. It's your, it's what yeah, you know, adds I, up to. Was I working? The answer is yes. But I was just like, I'm not going to, you know, the guy was under the way. I didn't want to tell you. He's like, take it. Don't worry about it. You know, uh, so it was fun. You're a nice guy. You're a mensch. You uh, my boyfriend is Jewish, by the way. Oh, there and you go. So you know how we are, the issues. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's exactly <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. All right, so you bring forth the topic getting in and out of Russia. And let's get, we're going to get to that story in just a second. But before we do, I did want to mention that we are playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show, live at the Hollywood Improv. We just finished our fourth show, and our next show is New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, oh, that's December 31st. It's a Friday night, 7.30, in the lab, 7.30 to, I, I'm going to go 9 o'clock. There'll probably be another show, and then there might be champagne. I'm not positive, but I, I do know yeah. I do know it's going to be a whole lot of fun. So you guys, come on down to the Hollywood Improv on Friday, December 31st, and uh, we'll see it's Story Smash. Having so much fun. We're really having fun. When you come, Avi, you'll have to judge some night when you're in L.A. Yeah, we'd love to. Anytime. All right. Cool. When I'm Uh, in L.A., yeah. Yeah, I know. You're out of town a lot. You go back and forth a lot to Israel. Yeah, I do a tour there twice a year. So I was going to say, you do these huge tours there, and it's so impressive because, obviously, the places are jammed. And you must have so much fun. It must. Yeah, yeah, it's great. We do. It's a, it's called comedy for Kobe. It benefits the Kobe Mandel Foundation. They work with children of trauma, and um, so I'll go and MC it and open the show. And then I usually bring like three comics with me. That's so, so it's, cool. It's, it's always it lately been a challenge, but we were able to pull off the last one by the skin of our teeth with COVID rules back and forth and all that stuff. But um, it's brilliant when, when that stuff is going on. It's it, it's usually. She's we would do one in the winter time and one in the summertime. And Brilliant. So, and who was that little boy, Kobe, whatever? Kobe Mandel, yeah. So he and his friend, Kobe Mandel was 13, and his friend, uh, Yosef Ishran, was 12. Respect, And they were both killed by terrorists in uh, a cave. Uh, they were beaten to death by terrorists outside of Jerusalem in a place called Tekoa, uh, just a village outside Jerusalem. So and, uh, the, the parents of the boy, Kobe, they had three other kids. And they realized that, you know, obviously that affects kids. And, other, and they realized, like, other families must be going through this. So they, they turned a tragedy into, like, a, a triumph by starting Amazing. a camp for other kids that have also lost immediate family members. And now they've expanded it to even any accident. It used to just be just for terrorist attacks. But thank God yeah. that's died down. But sure. um, now it's just any child trauma. that's been a, a child of trauma. Yeah. So they have a summer camp with hundreds of kids twice a year. Amazing. So kids learn, oh, I'm not the only one who's been through this. And... You know, yeah. they can relate, and it's um, it's interesting. It's one of these places where counselors will fight to uh, get a place to be a counselor there for free. Wow. It's like they don't That's pay the counselors, so and wonderful. there's like a wait list of counselors that want to go there. They even told me one story of a guy uh, in Israel. They, had, they bring in uh, counselors from the U.S. also. Yeah. And, but there's some of the counselors, one guy said he was Israeli, and he was there, and he told his army unit he was in the army at the time. He goes, I'm just telling you that I'm going to Camp Kobe to be a counselor. They're like, well, you're in the army. He goes, you can file the charges for me being AWOL right now. I'm just telling you that I'm leaving. Wow. And he did. Like, he's like, I'm sorry. Did he get I, in that, trouble? That, I, I'm not sure, but that's, I think he just told his unit, you know, you can arrest me when I get back. But that's what it meant to him. You know, he's just like, yeah. I'm going back. Aww. So <laughs> that's they obviously so do great stuff. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. That's so sweet. It, may, it gives you such a different sense of purpose. And it makes it all, you know, um, 
it feels good, but you're also doing such a good thing. So it's like a win-win. You're having yeah, fun. Yeah, it's a win-win like on three levels in the sense yeah, that it's – all these levels. These people exactly. go and you know, they're, they're paying to go to a great show. So that's number one. They're paying well worth watching, it. like elite comics with you know tons of credits. And the money goes to a charity, which is also right. great. It's that it benefits this charity. And the comics get to go and see a part of the world that they probably most likely would never really see and see kind Absolutely. of the real. Israel's PR is awful. So it's good that they get to come and see what Absolutely. the reality is. You know, so that's kind of Absolutely. nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Vacation is what it is, for sure. Yeah, that's, well, that's the thing. I'm obviously, I'm, you know, they get a stipend. They get some money. But it's certainly not what certainly comics, you know, a Jeff yeah. Ross, a Craig Robinson, a Harlan Williams. You know, these no, guys I have gone. It. Obviously, I can't pay them what their rates are. I get that. So, I get that. You know, so but it's it, you that's can easily why it has get to be a great experience. So yeah, because comedians are so, would be so willing to do that because it's like you said, it's fun and they learn. And uh, the thing is with the stereotype is that what I think the stereotype is. I'm not saying I feel this. This is what I think the stereotype is: is that everybody's fighting all the time, that there is wars in the street, like every yeah, day so it's rockets just a giant are being war zone. So it's, Yeah, the comics laugh when they get there. It's, <laughs> I remember once I was there with uh, Bob Zaney. Yeah. And Johnny Sanchez. And um, who was the third comic? I don't remember in a minute. Um, so when we were on that tour and um, we're in Haifa for the night. It's, and it's plastered all over the news because like a tire was burning outside. Oh, riots in Haifa. And we were in Haifa and there's a beautiful view and we're walking outside. Yeah. It's really nice. I go, does this seem like what is being portrayed on TV? We're like laughing about it. How stupid of course. this was. It was just, yeah, of it was course. silly. You know, because a kid lights a tire on fire. All of a sudden that's... It's sensationalist nonsense, you know. So, yeah, but everything I know about Israel and what I've heard from uh, my boyfriend's mom has gone several times, and, and uh, it's, it's very cosmopolitan, actually. Like oh, yeah. The, the Tel Aviv is basically, it's a combo of, like, you know, Miami's beach, uh, you know, New York's nightlife, and, you know, L.A.'s weather. So it's uh, See, one of those things. that's those the like. promos they should be talking about because yeah. the, pro- the, <laughs> the, the uh, advertising is... Is not great. That's for sure. No, they suck at it. But they've gotten oh, right. a little bit better at it over the years, but they still, it's not their forte. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Now, I don't know how updated my your, your bio is, so you can help me with this. Now, I know that, of course, you've been doing stand-up forever, and you performed on CBS's Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson and Comedy yeah. Central's, you know, those those older shows, Premium yeah, Blend, Make Me stuff, Laugh. Yeah. I remember all those very well because that was I've been here that long as well. Um, and you know, all the, and then on, uh, you'd be on NBC Friday night and then you did an awful lot of little tiny parts in sitcoms like Boston Common and Yeah, Dave's yeah. Every now World. and then I'd, I'd weasel on TV to some sitcoms here and that, you know, they I look mean, at you, they see you as a comic and that's what you're auditioning for. But it's, I, I, you know, I was acting a lot more years ago, but I gravitated more towards screenwriting lately. Yeah. So, and, I think uh, it's I'm a big exciting. history and religion fan. So I sold one movie and then optioned another. So that's uh, and I just actually completed writing a book about my travels during COVID, which will lead into the Russia story. Okay, but, good. Uh, okay, good. I gravitated more towards that. The movie was so. through the keyhole, right? No, no, that was uh, that. That was actually a pilot they did on ABC a long time ago. The, the movie that I sold is actually the story of the Exodus, but through the eyes of the women. Wow, most famous thing I've ever done. Uh, but that's wow. uh, it's a story basically of Moses's sister Miriam and Pharaoh's daughter Bethia and their relationship. Wow! And, uh, I based it just on the biblical text, and I ta- I had it vetted by pastors and rabbis, and um, so I was able to sell that. And is, it, is of, it is it super historical or is it funny or how do you make this? No, no, go? History, it's interesting. People ask, "Oh, you're a comic. You write all these comedies, right?" I, I no. Most of the stuff that I write is actually historically based. I wrote that, and then I optioned another one. I wrote a film about St. Patrick. Believe it or not, wow. um, I went to Ireland three times to do the research about it. Met with a professor of Celtic studies. Professor Daimio Croynan, and uh, so it's, you know, those are my favorite stories. It's like stories that, oh, I've heard of it. Like, oh, you've heard of the Exodus, everyone knows the Ten Commandments, whatever. We know Moses, we know the story, but not the intricacy between about his sister. And boy, it's the story boy. that, oh, I've heard of St. Patrick's Day, but nobody really knows about the guy and, like, the influence that he had on Western civilization. Like, nobody knows... Well, you know, he created green beer, isn't that of true? Of course, that's the main thing. No, but nobody knows like his reality. Like he, you know, he revolutionized reading. Like you know, there'd be no capital letters, paragraphs, 
uh, separating words on a page. Those are all Irish monastic scholars who he influenced in a sense to start. He was a big literacy advocate. That's his thing. I didn't know this before I started researching well, it. Well, then you know, why so. don't why do we call it punctuation? Why don't we just call it Patrick? Yeah, it should be. The, Patrick the, yeah, He doesn't get the credit he deserves. He's the only person of ancient history who uh, was first of all, he, number one, people don't know this. He's number one. He's not a saint. Number two, he's not Irish. <laughs> like people don't know this. <laughs> He was kidnapped by Irish me? pirates and sold as a slave. So my friend Mindy, she told, I remember her saying that any story that begins kidnapped by Irish pirates, oh man, I want to know what the heck's going on with that. So it just made me laugh that she said that. But it, yeah, he's the only person ever of ancient record to be sold as a slave, uh, escape, make it back across an ocean, reunite with his family, and then voluntarily go back to his captors. Uh, you know, it's just the story itself is like insane. I was just like... How has this not been made? Like, I feel like this guy's Obvi, story is that nuts. is so, so fabulous. No, I I didn't know any of that. I really yeah, didn't. Yeah, I know so. he did. I didn't know it either. So this, I don't even remember how that kind of came up. The Miriam one, I was a little more intricate in research. You know, I had that kind of in the back of my, my mind for a while. And I would just, I, I saw, you know, every few years somebody comes out with a movie about the Exodus. And they're usually either not great or historically completely inaccurate. I was just like, why doesn't somebody base this on... Just what the text say and what mm-hmm. commentators on the text. Let's take that approach. That, so that's kind of what I did. It's so uh, interesting. It you would think that would have been done. Yeah, no, I just think that people get kind of hung up on sensationalizing things. And that's, you know, and it's just uh, that sort of takes away from what happened. I just sort of, sort of realized, like, the women in the story, there's a, there's a quote in the Talmud that says, uh, were it not for the righteousness of women, we would not have been redeemed in Egypt. I'm like, well, somebody should tell that story because I've certainly never heard it. <laughs> and I just kind of felt like the women were getting screwed. And the, like, you know, the Shocking. Uh, yeah, Shifra and Pua, who are the two handmaids, who are like kind of just completely left out of every story. And they're in the Old Testament. Like, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. This, is, this isn't even a theory. Like, they're in the story. The first, you know, case of defying a state law based on ethical grounds were those two women. You know, when wow. Pharaoh goes, kill all the firstborns, and they go, no, we're not doing it. They're the reason why the Nazis going, well, I was just following orders. Uh, that's not good enough. You know, and they were. They could, the Nazis could just say, well, those are the laws. What do you want me to do? Wow. But they go, no, nah, uh-uh. that's not good enough. You knew what you were doing was wrong. And Schiffer and Poor are the example. You know, they said, well, they didn't do it. You know, they knew what they were doing was wrong. And it, that order was immoral and unethical, and they didn't, they didn't follow through on it. Boy, so, Avi, you're like a scholar. I didn't even really know this side yeah, of thank you. you. So I'm just it's, no, <laughs> it's very so. interesting. And these are both feature films. Yeah, yes, yeah. Wow. So and do you write on the done. airplanes because you're traveling a lot? Or w- w- where do you write? Sometimes there, but it's the hardest thing to do is, uh, you know, to self-discipline. Especially nowadays, it's even harder, I think. Cause yeah, you're, I think you know, so. Facebook is a click away. Right. With, you know, YouTube is a click away. So it, it's very difficult to sit down and... I'd kind of have to make a schedule. Otherwise, I'm just not going to do it. You know, I know yeah. myself. And that's the hardest thing to do is to sit down and just, you know, pl- I was always jealous of those guys that could sit down and just crank out stuff or I just sit and write for three hours a day. I'm just like, well, you're you're a better person than I am because I just well, can't. I, I find that so hard. You know, you also so have difficult. to think about, like, do they do any downtime or do they go to the gym or do they have any other life or is that? Yeah, I'm sure they do. But these guys and I've seen them who can just sit there for three hours straight and gut it out. I was just like, it's, I envy those guys because I just find that so hard to do. Yeah, me it's too. It's very difficult. But, I, you know, I try to try to get it done. I hear um, you. you know, it's hard. All right, you guys, you can find more out about Avi over at his website, avilieberman.com, and also follow him on Instagram at Insta at Avi Lieberman Comedy. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for Avi Lieberman. Thank you. Okay, so the story about how I got in and out of Russia, that um, I had been traveling during COVID, and that was uh, the last country I was going to. I used Israel as kind of my base. And I was for, I had COVID very early, so I had the antibody. So I wasn't really scared about traveling. It's, and I had PCR tests after PCR tests still showing I was negative. And um, so then the question was, I got to Israel, and the rule there was suddenly they, made, they had countries that were green. You could go to a green country, come back, and not have to quarantine. And while they're under their lockdowns, I was viciously against the lockdowns. I couldn't stand them. They were just like, you know, depressing. I was like, well, I'm going to bail. I'm going to get out of here and just go to whatever's open and try to have some sense of life. So I'd been to Greece and Bulgaria, and they were kind of picking for me, like what country I went to Dubai. I did a show there. I was the first Israeli citizen to perform there. Um, and uh, 
Wait a second. Wait yeah. a second. Just back up one second. So you just packed up some bags and you found uh, friends to stay with or did you that's, find gigs ahead of time? I mean, you did something. Yeah. I had used all these points that I had saved up on my credit card, just like, you know, because no one was really traveling. So these hotels were super cheap. And so I was like, I'll just take advantage. Might as well. When am I going to be able to stay in the premier palace in the Ukraine in Kiev again? That's not going to happen where I'm paying, you know, what Amazing. little I'm paying. How was so that? And I, then it just became a question of why I got back to Israel and they sort of had this rule in the middle. You could get kind of this health pass. If you had COVID and recovered, took a serological test proving you had the antibodies and got a doctor to sign off on it, you could go to any country you wanted, come back and no quarantine. And so that sort of became my focus. Wow. So who, who was the doctor that signed off on that? That's, that was- oddly enough, one of the doctors who was a fan of coming to our comedy for Kobe shows was on the Corona task force. Wow. So one of our producer goes, this is the woman you need to call. So I, I contacted her. She's like, take the test. Let me see it. See your antibody count, the whole thing, and then I'll sign off on it. So I did. She saw it. So I was fine. Got the signature, and, it's, and she said, you're good to go. Oh, so, now, so good to have friends. This, yeah, this, yeah, thank God she came to the show, right? So it's, it, comedy pays off every now and then. <laughs> That's what I'm so, saying. And, uh, so this, once I had that, I was like, okay, well, now I have this thing. Now it isn't a question of uh, what country is red or not. I don't care. The question is, like, what's open? What am I going to go to that's open? So uh, I bumped into this guy in the outdoor market in Tel Aviv, that, and he goes, oh, do you know what? Talk to that woman. She's from the Ukraine. So I go up to her, she's like, the Ukraine, she's like, there is no chance the Ukraine is going to close before January 8th because they're Orthodox Christian there. And their Christmas is January 7th. So there is no chance because people will just tell them to stick it because there are too many parties and family get, get togethers. So I go, Gary, she's like, get run tea. They'll just rebel and say no. So I said, okay. So I ended up going to Ukraine and then I got back. And I still was like, I'm not coming back to California. Everybody said, don't come back here. It's still miserable. So it's just like, okay, well, what else? It was like, oh, well, wait a minute. Russia, or Christian Orthodox also, they're not going to close before the 8th. It was still kind of late December, early January. I'm just like, well, why don't I try to go to Russia? The, the hiccup was uh, you had to be a Russian citizen to get in um, unless you were going for medical reasons. So I was like, well, what does that entail? So my friend's friend, uh, her husband was a lawyer who was stationed there for a couple of years in Moscow. So I, he's, she's like, you know what, WhatsApp her, see what the story is. And she's like, well, some people are making doctor's appointments, quote unquote, coming in and not going to them. And that's kind of getting them in, in and out. So she's just like, well, I didn't see a dermatologist at the time anyway. Like I had a small little rash thing on my leg. I was just like, yeah, could I have bought some antifungal cream and got rid of the thing on my knee? Whatever. I was like, yeah, sure, but that didn't get me in the country. So I was just like, you know, she goes, we go to this place called the EMC, the European Medical Center. They're in a you know, very high end for Russia. Whatever. Uh, this is where the diplomats and the oligarchs go. Um, so I was like, all right. She goes, what's happened? They'll talk to you in English. I go, okay. So I did. They were super helpful. They go, we're more than happy to prepare the paperwork for you. If you, if you. Here was the scary part. I had to put down a 1,200 euro uh, deposit. Wow. And that that kind of scared me a little bit because it's Russia. Like half the, the mob runs half the country. So I'm just like, am I going to get this back? I know she's like, no, 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 this is a legit place. So I kind of the law so they uh, I make the appointment. And oddly enough, the dermatologist I ended up seeing was Israeli. He had had a practice. He was a Russian Israeli. He had had practice in Israel. So, and I showed up, I needed to see one anyway. I wasn't kind of, you know, BSing. I needed to go. And they, that got me in, that got me into the country. First, they're like, go sit over there, wait a second. And I was at border patrol. They're like, oh, no. you know, and then they're like, okay, you're good to go. And I went to the appointment where you got by in broken Hebrew and English. He was a super nice guy, he prescribed the cream for me that I needed, got rid of it, uh, looking back. But then, it, so getting in worked and I was having a great time while I was there. I was touring and I got to stay in the Marriott Grand Moscow for no way I'm ever going to pay what I pay it again you know, for, to stay there. And it was just great to be in an open society. You know, there was a gym and, you know, there was a pool and I could go to all these things. And it was just great. And, and um, so then it, it came to leaving. So Israel all of a sudden makes this rule. They are going to close their airport permanently for the first time. Not permanently, but uh, they were shutting down the airport for the first time in their history. Um uh, ever that there were going to be no flights in or out, and that's it. This, we're going to conquer COVID by doing this, which of course failed miserably. But anyway, that's what I had to deal with. So I was in Saint. Now I'd been through this before, where Israel. I was in Bulgaria, and they declared. Sorry, I was in Serbia, and they declared Serbia a red country starting on uh, Sunday. And it was like Wednesday or something. So they gave you like this four day grace period. I was supposed to fly back on Sunday, but I wasn't going to 
quarantine for two weeks based on a few hours. So I had to change my flight and go back Saturday. So this, I knew the Corona committee was meeting on a Sunday night. And they were going to, you know, everybody said the big rumor is they're going to close the airport permanently. But I was so my, and I'm in St. Petersburg at the time in the Hermitage, the great, beautiful palace slash, you know, museum now, one of the great museums in the world. I'm enjoying myself and my friends are sending me all these WhatsApp, you know, these messages. You're going to get screwed. You're going to get stuck. And I'm messaging them back. Kiss my ass. You're just upset that you're trapped and I'm having a good time, you know, and I'm just talking because I knew the last time they did this, they gave you like a three, four day grace period. And I was coming back two days later. So what the hell did I care? I didn't care. Let him meet. Let him close the airport. What do I care? They're not going to make me come back tomorrow. Well, surprise. That's exactly what they did. And they said, you have to come back tomorrow. And you have to have a negative PCR test. I'm just like, geniuses. That assumes that every flight gets back after 6.30 p.m. And to get a PCR test, it takes 24 hours to get the results. How am I supposed to get a PCR test, you bureaucrat morons? Like, what am I, you know, and, it's, and one, I had to change my So I, I free, my friend sends me a message going, Avi, no screwing around. You need to get back here. And this is a friend of mine that we normally just trash talk about sports. And there was no trash talking at all. He's like, get back here or you're stuck. Um, so I, was, I called panicked. I called Turkish Airlines and they, thank God, they had a 4.30 p.m. flight. But it's like 8 o'clock at night already. How am I going to get a PCR test in the middle of St. Petersburg at 8 at night? It was impossible. Um, so and, um, did I changed on my flight. Just like, well, I'll worry about the PCR test later. Um, in the meantime, I'm screwed. So did, um, I go back to the hotel that night, and I had a show online for a synagogue in L.A. at 4 in the morning, the oh following morning. So I got to get up, and I had food poisoning <laughs> that night before. I get back to the hotel, puke all over the place. Uh, so I'm in pain, but I go to sleep, get up a few hours later. I do the show online, which I think goes well. <laughs> and then I got to rush back to Moscow now to catch this new flight. And the guys that go, listen, you can make the train. You're going to miss the first train back to the airport by like five minutes. But just hang out. Take the next one. You should be okay. And so I get to Moscow. Then I walk out. So I'm just like, you know, I don't wait here for 40 minutes. I have a few Russian rubles left. Let me go check with the mafioso cap guys just to see what they say. So I go outside. They're, of course, charging like triple what they, the, the Russian Uber is called Yandex. And uh, the guy couldn't find me. First, I tried that. And it was like, you know, a third of what these guys wanted to charge. And he couldn't find me. And no one knows English. So I get outside. And the cabbies know English a little bit. So I get outside and I go, look, these are all the rubles I have left. And everything there's in cash, like there's no credit cards really, even for the Uber. Um, and they kind of pull their mafioso huddle and they're like, they call over the guy. There's like, okay, he'll take you. I said, this is all I got. You know, I knew they didn't want to miss the fare. So they give me this guy, older guy, he, you know, with the cigarette rolled up in his mouth. He walks me over to the 1980s commie mobile and we start going. This traffic is horrendous. Like I do this to save time. It didn't save time. All of a sudden, like out of an 80s sitcom, his cab starts to uh, smoke and it breaks in the middle of the freeway. And he doesn't know anything. So I'm banging on the seat like, he's like, problem, problem. And he pulls over. He lifts up the hood. And I'm just like, buddy, which is the first sign of I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I tell him, I go, I have to go. Like I'm screaming at him like, I can't miss this flight. There is no next flight. You know. And then he, uh, he's, I go, forget it. Pull over. I, and he, we get back on the road. And we're going like 10 miles an hour. The car is not working. Like, it's just not. And people are flying by me. And I start banging on the side. I go, pull over. Pull over. I'm banging. He doesn't understand. I'm banging. And he's waving his hand. So finally, he pulls over. And I go to, like, rush into English on my phone. Go and give me my money back. I have no cash on me. Like, I, I need the money back to Yandex from here. Maybe I can, you know, get a cab from here. And so he gives me begrudgingly some of the money back. And I go, I need this much back because I yandex how much it was to get from where I was. I'm in the middle of nowhere, like a suburb uh, off of some freeway in Moscow. And I got to get to, y y you know, Vinovka Airport. And uh, I yandex again. The cab still can't find me. And then I see the guy across the street. He can't get over to where I am. And all of a sudden, I see this cab out of nowhere, this savior, this young kid pulls up in a cab and I flag him down and I just scream at him. I go, for no, for no, for no. and he waves me and okay, go ahead. And I just did. And we got there and I was a few rubles short. He's like, it's okay. He couldn't mind. And he flew there. He gets me there. And I get to the airport now. So when I'd gone to the Ukraine, I'd used this sort of bogus PCR test because I had to, uh, excuse me. I had a, I had a, a serological test and I was going to the Ukraine. They didn't require one. You, had a, you had a what? You had to have a PCR test. So what I didn't know at the time was because uh, only uh, Turkish Airlines, 
Uh, Lufthansa didn't require this. BA didn't require this. Swissair didn't require this. If you were traveling in transit, you didn't need a PCR test. You're just passing through the airport. You're, it's fine. Do whatever you need to do wherever your final destination is. But I had a serological test, which is better than a PCR test. It showed that I have live antibodies at the time. I just didn't have time to get a PCR test because I was focused on getting the serological. And they're like, I go, they go, well, where's your PCR test when I was going to the Ukraine? Uh, but I just had a feeling just in case, just thinking, they go, well, I have a serological. Well, you're traveling through Turkey, so you need one. I go, in transit? They're like, yeah. I go, well, okay, here it is. And I, I had moved an old one to the front of my phone and taken another photo of it. Right. And she didn't pay attention to the date. And it turns out that when I got to Turkey, they changed that rule the day I arrived. Like, this is how ridiculous the bureaucracy was. It was just everything was different every other day. So it was just so stupid. Um, that, and so I, I was like, oh, let me try that in Russia. Because I knew there was no way I could get a PCR test. I had less than 24 hours. The geniuses in Israel didn't think this through. Um, so I get to the front. And I was like, well, at least I made it to the airport on time. I show her the PCR test. And, and I was like, she'll ignore the date. Just like they did in you know, Ukraine. She's first thing I remember, when is the date? Like she couldn't see it. So she's like, she's not letting me on the plane. I go, lady, I, look, this, there's no way. She goes, oh, we have rapid tests. You should have gotten here earlier. At the time, I didn't know what a rapid test was. You could have gotten one in two hours. Of course, if the genius cabbie would have gotten me there in time, I could have done this. But I didn't have time at, at, at this point. I, now I had like an hour and a half. So I missed this by half an hour. It's, and then I, um, so she's not letting me out. I go, look, the, I, and I explained to her, the airport is closing. I have no other option. Here's my serological. She's like, she calls her boss over who looks like, you know, the Russian mafia, every stereotype of like the mafia king. And he comes over and goes, I have to check with the embassy. I'm like, check with the embassy. They're not going to get back to you in time. You know, I have 30 minutes before I got to get on this plane. In the end, I see her. I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting. She's like, he'll handle it. Don't worry. And I see boarding passes being printed. I'm the last one there. She gives them to me. That, and I not my bag won't make it. What do I do with my bag? I got I got to check their boarding now. He goes, take with you to gate. They will check at the gate. So the, and I run through security. Thank God there was no line. They take the bag and they put it underneath. And then well, I, and I'm, I'm I'm connecting through Istanbul. And some guy in Istanbul tells me, Oh wait, Avi, you can take a rapid test in Istanbul. And I go, oh, Okay. And I have a two hour about, about thirty minute you know layover or something. And oh, at least that might fix the plan of me having to fight with them maybe in, in Istanbul. And we're about to land. You can't make this up. And then wheels up again because of wind shear. It's another 30 minutes. Now we land. I have about a 10-minute window. I fly off the plane. I go running, and I see this guy sitting there. I go, is this where I get a PCR test? He's at the booths that look like where you take it. And he won't answer me. He's like, "Uh, police, go get police. So I run and get the – and I have to go all the way through security. uh, And I end up back with the same guy who said, go get police. And I go, can I take the test here or not? And he won't answer the question. I start screaming in the airport, does anyone here speak English? Like, I'm screaming because this guy just won't, won't be helpful to me. This woman comes around from, like, an exchange booth. They start arguing in Turkish. And she turns to me and goes, he won't answer me either. I'm just like, can you just ask this guy yes or no? Can I take a test? I have about 60 seconds to make this decision. And he just won't give it to me. So then someone goes, there's an information booth way down the hall. Just go ask them. And then they go, oh, we don't do that here anymore. Like, after all this headache... So, and then I get to the gate at Turkish Airlines, but thank God I have the boarding pass already, but I still don't have this PCR test. And I get to the point, she's like, I need your PCR. I go, I don't, and I'm about to argue with her. She's like, don't worry about it. Take the test in Israel. I go, okay. So then at least they let me on the plane. And then I got to Israel and thank God when I got from the Ukraine, that was the trip before, I had my little health thing that kept me out of quarantine. Of course, it didn't work when I landed from the Ukraine. But it was rectified like a couple days later. They let me out of the quarantine and sent me a text, you're good to go. So I landed from Russia thinking it'll be the same problem. And miraculously, it worked. I got there. They're like, oh, here's your red wristband. You don't have to go through, you know, line A, go to line B. You can just go pick up your bags. You're good to go. No quarantine. So it was just insane, though. Like getting in, I weaseled my way in, miraculously got out. I made it back to Israel with half an hour to spare before they permanently closed the airport (laughs) for that period of time, like half an hour. Oh, my God. Avi, was, this story is so insane. It's out of like an 80s sitcom with the, you, the car breaking on the freeway. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. I was just like, it was ridiculous. The guy you, you know? just spoke with in the airport who wouldn't help, was he in uniform? Why? Who was that He's like sitting there just eating a sandwich. It, I never, I, there was no human being more frustrating to me but, in the past decade of my life. Like but, I was just like, <laughs> just answer the question, yes or no. I know, PCR, but why yes did you no. go to him? That's because he was the only guy sitting in the spots where you were supposed to take the test. But was he in uniform? 
This, yeah, he was an employee. Yeah, oh, no question. Okay. He was behind there these desks. Okay. And I got another woman to come up to him, I, and she got frustrated with him. Yeah. She turns to me and goes, this guy won't answer me either. Even she was frustrated with him, and they were speaking in Turkish, and they started yelling at each other. And what? And, it's, yeah, and maybe he was deaf. Could that he be? Deaf. He was just a jerk. He was just, like, a frustrated... I was so frustrated with this guy. At least the Russian people, they were doing their jobs. You know, yeah. okay, you know, they can't let me on because I don't have the paperwork for the rule that they passed five minutes ago, which will change 10 minutes later. Or and whatever. what does PCR stand for again? Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, I've had over 20 of them. You figure I should know the answer to that question, but it's um, something I'm not sure. It's PCR Listen, antigen. Those are the two tests that you can take to, to show that you're negative. I see. No, I'm so time. impressed and I'm so excited how cosmopolitan you are. I mean, in terms of traveling yeah. Yeah, it's just out of my my it 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 it's just from my frustration and impatience. That's that's all it's all it stems from. I know, so. but still, it's really um, it's really impressive. I've traveled a lot in my life, but mostly with other people. Like one time, I one time I found myself in Australia by myself for like a week. But other than that, like I've always been with other people, backpacking, or I've also done like you know really nice things, but. Uh, it's so in- interesting how you're just so independent that way. I mean, do you? Yeah, this, I, I, some people. I think it's just a personality thing. Like I went to Bulgaria with a girl, that, and imme- immediately realized this was a mistake. We just kind of saw things differently, and it's, our approaches in terms of traveling was different. And I kind of helped her along the way to see when we realized this wasn't going to turn anything, you know, serious. But it was. Uh, it's, I realize I'm kind of better on my own in those situations. I, yeah. I love meeting up with locals and them showing me around. It's, then I, I will totally take a back seat and travel with somebody. I got no problem with that. It's, but in terms of like when I'm on my own, I kind of want to do my own thing. Yeah, I, mean, I get it. Just it. Kind so, of stems from being single, single for a long time. So give me an example of what was happening with you and her. You wanted to do what? You wanted to do this, and she wanted to do what? Correct. And it's, I'm more of like, um, you know, a punctual on time. If I say, let's, if I'm like, oh, let's meet at, let's say four o'clock, that doesn't mean five thirty because you're dragging late. You know, that's, you know, I, we want to do stuff, you know, how often are we in a place like this? Let's, let's make the and most of it. She was, she was always mm-hmm. late there. I mean, in other constantly, words, constantly. Wow. And just, it's, you know, we decided to meet at this place and she drew up like hours late. What was she doing know? when she was late? Uh, what she was getting her hair done at one place. She goes, we could find it. We were in Bulgaria. We could get our hair cut. It was, it was very exciting. You know, I could, you know, Israel was shut down. And so we could go to a barber. She could get her hair done. I get it. Oh, I you see. Know, and then we had, we went to the synagogue that, and um, they asked me, you know, I had arranged, made the arrangements and showed her where it was and all these things. And then the next day for lunch, for example, that she's not hours late, you know, during the lunch, she shows up towards the end. Wow. They're like, is she coming? I was just like, I don't know. That but, is you know, so I don't know frustrating. What's going on. It's just that's kind of stuff. Drove yeah, me nuts, that you know? stuff sucks, man. When you're traveling with somebody, you're so screwed. I yeah, do so much it's, better it's in a lot of situations alone as well, like concerts specifically. You know, like getting close to the stage or like enjoying a certain show because I don't mind being in a single seat, as it were. And uh, but, but and internationally to a point because I was a flight attendant. But like I said, I was in you know I was with a crew or whatever. Right, right, right. Those are people who know the deal. So, if they but know I would the deal, never flight attendants like you. They know. You know. Yeah, if the flight attendants or the pilots were cool, I might go out with them. But if I'm in Munich for 34 hours and you're like you just want to go down to the hotel bar, uh, we're not hanging out. Like I'll yeah, just yeah, no, you want to do things. And yeah, things. I always so, that's did how my I was. things. For me, as soon as I land someplace, like it's a Unless I have something scheduled the next day with like a local who's helping me out, which I, I mentioned, I just finished writing a book about traveling during COVID. Oh, that was um, neat. That's a good idea. Yeah. And I, I said a few like tips in there. And one of them is, you know, find a local post on Facebook. You're going to be here. Or you're going to be there. Invariably, there usually will be somebody who knows somebody and a local is just invaluable. They'll help you with certain things that you, you know, where can I just, where's the best place to eat or yeah, and then know. and they'll take you around, and then you tip them well. Oh, yeah, you take the, you tip them well at the end of the day. It's, That's it. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, you know it, it's great stuff. It's just something as simple as taking a cab from the airport in Belgrade. Sure. That you know my friend set me up with a driver, which was invaluable. Yeah. Paying him 
was half the money what I would have paid the mafioso cab guys. Right. And then we became buddies. He drove. I needed a driver to go to Novi Sad and just like call him. He's I, your guy. I have a friend was, in you know. Istanbul. Same thing happened. Uh, it, you know, we paid him because he was working for a service, but then we just started paying him on our own. And we, yeah, no, of course, we've That's remained friends. Yeah. yeah, but let people know where you're going to be. And those things I find social media very valuable, especially for people like me you and too. me who travel for a living almost. That you know, aside from just drumming up. You know, this is, you know, hopefully people in the crowd. It lets people know, oh, my friend lives here. You should contact yeah. this guy. And then, yeah, I may have like new friends now. Yeah. You yeah. know, because of this. Why so did you, real quick, at the beginning of the story, why were you were already in Russia? Why did you come, or you were already in the Ukraine? Why did you come back to LA before you went to Russia again? I didn't. I was going back and forth to Israel. Israel was sort of my base because Israel oh, was obviously I just see. closer to these places. So I stayed in Israel for seven months. I but, see. Going but while back I was and forth. there, I was almost every month I was leaving and going somewhere else. And so what kind of food poisoning did you get? It's, I went and I would still recommend you go there. It's still good food. I just, I've had this happen before where it's, I will eat the same thing as everybody else. And all of a sudden I'll get a bug or something and everybody else will be fine. And I'll feel it in my chest. I'm like, yep, I got to throw up. This is bad. This, I had, um, I think it was the chicken soup and then I had a lamb dish oh. and I finished the chicken soup and I just like, something's wrong. I had something, something was in there that just didn't, I took one bite of lamb and I go, yep, I got to go back and throw up. So this and, but it was still a good restaurant. The food tasted great. I'm sure 99 times out of 100, you'll be fine there. Wow, you're so. generous. That would piss me off. That's not That's, good. I, I mean, I, I've had that feeling before. That's, and I was at a friend's wedding, and it was like very high end food, and everybody was fine but me. Yeah. So you, you have a sensitive system. Usually I don't. That's a strange thing. It's usually just like one thing. So I would go straight back to the place. I'd, I'd give him another chance. Well, so. you are very <laughs> so. sweet. Um, I also wanted to ask you about, you know, did you do comedy in all these cities or just, the, some just of them. I, in I, Israel? I performed actually, uh, the Globe and Mail covered it when I performed in Dubai because I was the first Israeli citizen to perform there. And I did an hour long show about like 50 minutes in Moscow, which was great. And where did you um, perform in Dubai? Dubai was it? Uh, this woman, Gail, who's a total sweetheart, runs a comedy club there called The Laughter Factory. Really? Uh, this is the Laugh Factory. This is the Laughter Factory. Mostly Brits. She's English herself. Dubai has a massive English presence. Uh, they sort of, you know, helped get the country started. Sure. Uh, they were the first people to, you know, pump oil at her. So um, even the plugs in the hotels in Dubai, uh, right. they're all the British kind. Yeah, uh, I've, you know, I've you know. been to Dubai. I spent just yeah, a few, so you know. few days um, there. I know, but I think to myself, like, you know, they've been there, but it's the people that built Dubai are, you know, from Bangladesh or... Yeah, Pakistan. yeah, it's all over the place. But in yeah. terms of, like, the Western influence is more yeah. British than, than And America, so how right? did so. you find Dubai? I found it incredible, um, but it's, it's not the like... Accords. It was like this historical thing where Israel and, and the UAE had made these peace treaty. So just so all these Israelis were flocking that, you know, as soon as it was allowed and they had fly Dubai, they had direct flights... Israel was still doing their stupid lockdowns. So I just said, every, all these Israelis were like, well, we're out of here. You know, we're all going to travel there because they were So where did you stay? Do you remember where you stayed? The, yes. I, oh, yeah. I stayed in Jumaira Lakes Towers, which was nice and which was pretty inexpensive. It was okay. Everything else is expensive. Like Ubering is a lot of money. Food is a lot of money, you know. But staying in the hotels, you can find very nice hotels for a reasonable price. Did you go um, out to Burj Al Arab? Yes, of course. Yeah. That's, we went there. Um, but, oh, Burj Al No, I didn't go to Burj Al Arab. I went to Burj Khalifa. I oh, yeah. The, the, you know, I went that. to the top of that, too. Did you go to the top? It's, yeah, I went to the, the bar there on the 130th floor or something. Uh-huh. Interesting. Which was nice to see with a friend. My friend Jeremy, there's one kosher restaurant at the bottom of the Armani Hotel, um, which is oh, essentially the Burj Khalifa. Yeah. And you eat outside. It was like December, so it's like perfect weather. Wow. You know. And it was it was great. Doesn't so it remind you when you're up at the top of Burj Al Arab? Um, when you look down, doesn't it remind you a little bit of Vegas, just in terms? Oh, of... Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, they, it, they say it's Vegas without without the gambling and the hookers. Yeah, uh, it is. It's Vegas. Possibly and... the hookers. Who knows? But I didn't find. Well, but, but it is in terms you know. of like it's so specifically desert community and where. Oh yeah. Where the desert Absolutely. begins. It's what you'd think. It's, 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 you know, it's very plastic that, that some people said it's to some people to turn off cause it's not like super nature, natural, but they have that, you know, if you go out and, you know, out into the desert, you can do the Jeep tours and things like that. Yeah. And, but that's cheesy. You know. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Dubai is not a warm place in my opinion. No, it's, it's not warm. It's not inviting you. Well, yeah, are a someplace else. Foreigner. It's, it's touristville. Yeah. That's what it is. You are like, a you know. foreigner big time and it's very expensive. I, yeah, it, it ain't cheap. It's like, I walk through the malls. They're like, Oh, we have a sale today. 
so a polo shirt's a hundred bucks, not hundred and forty. Isn't you know, it it's, funny it's still like, how the malls have the exact same store as we do? Yeah, and ones that you never heard of that are twice the price. You know, just like what I know, is but this place? I just thought it was funny that that there's Forever Twenty One. Oh yeah, the Max store that they got and it all. There's it's the, the same and stuff. there's the Target, the and there's the. I mean, it's the yeah. exact same business stores. Business is business. Yeah, yeah, CVS, and then there's, um, you know, Barnes and Noble. It's just weird. Yeah, it's the same stuff. Same I thing. know, but people think that it'd be different. Where it's different is when you go to the ATM. And you put your money, if you put your, you know, your, your debit card in, it's coming out in different, in a different currency. Right, right. No, of course. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Listen, I'm thrilled to talk with you. You have so many, that, I mean, that was an amazing freaking story, man, really. It was nuts. And let me tell nuts. you something. Like, you, here's what you need to do. You need to date somebody like me. I'm not, I'm not propositioning you. I already have a boyfriend. It's, oh, someone like you in two seconds, Chris. But yeah, I'm telling yeah, you, because only because I've traveled a lot myself and I totally understand comedy, you need to get somebody who's definitely a little more grounded. They're probably going to be a little bit older, which is fine. They might have children, but they're probably grown. If the, if, if the, if the kids are, if the father of the children is a good person, no worries. You know, you're fine because right. they work it out. No, of course. It's, it's, hey, I'm open to anything at this stage in the game. I'm, I'm ready. But you definitely need somebody so. who has some more experience because um, I just heard your story and it's freaking great, man. I love it. I love it. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Hopefully we'll have more. Yeah. More good oh, ones coming you up. will. You <laughs> so. will. You guys, don't forget to follow Avi Lieberman over there on his um, on his Instagram page. Yeah, Avi Lieberman comedy. Exactly. L-I-B-E-R-M-A-N. I got it's a weird last name spelling. I know, because everybody it's thinks like it's L-I-E-B-E-R. And it's yeah, yeah. I'm one of the few people who spells it L-I-B. It's Lieberman. So. Liberman. Yeah. You don't spell Liberman, it that way. Yeah. That's the way it is spelled. In other words, you were born right. with that. My family jokes were the only ones who spell it right. Everybody else spells it wrong. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know. That's funny. Uh, all right, you guys. So definitely, yeah, definitely follow Avi over there. And then definitely follow Story Smash. That's where you're going to see all the show pictures. Yes. Add yes. Story Smash. For goodness sake, we're having such a blast. Show information again on Instagram at Story Smash. Or you can always go to the website, StorySmashShow.com. All right, you guys, one more time on behalf of the very talented comedian, Avi Lieberman. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This was great. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy of you. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Caregivers, are you and the person you care for not satisfied with your current home care agency? Then you need to call Help at Home as we offer the highest paid wages, weekly pay, overtime pay, benefits, and do not forget paid time off. Help at Home is actively recruiting caregivers who are caring for a loved one. We make changing agencies quick and easy. Call one of our care professionals now at 412-784-6711. That's 412-784-6711 or go to helpathomepa.com. Your plans? Today it's dinner with the parents at your spot. We gotta come back here. Now, their spot. Or you're on the edge of your seat at the game. Come on, just one time. And it's the one. Or maybe you're catching the next flight to... Now boarding flight 1850. Oh, that's you. The choice is yours. And when you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. And now, an Etsy holiday gifting mission. Today's episode, Operation Handcrafted and Affordable. 
Here's the situation. It's the holidays, which means you're on a mission to find handcrafted affordable gifts. You want items that will brighten the spirits of everyone on your list, but won't blow your budget. Sure, it sounds impossible, but there's no need to make shopping for gifts feel like it has the suspense and high stakes of a heart-pumping action franchise. It's time to simplify your gifting experience with Etsy. Whether you're searching for handmade home pieces like serveware, cutting boards, and throw pillows for your favorite holiday hosts, or personalized items like necklaces, handbags, and seasonal jackets for your most stylish friends and family, Etsy has it. Get handmade items for all budgets and any gifting mission. New to Etsy? Use the code HOLIDAY10 for 10% off your first purchase. That's code HOLIDAY10. Maximum discount value of $50 expires December 31st, 2023. See terms at etsy.com slash terms. Shop Etsy.com. Etsy has it.